Well, my friends, this morning we are continuing a sermon series that we've been in for a few weeks now that we're calling Asking for a Friend, Honest Questions for God. And each week in this series, we are looking at a challenging and an honest question for God. The kind of questions that maybe you've carried for quite some time that you maybe feel embarrassed or ashamed that you still have, or maybe it's the kind of question that has been a barrier to faith for you or for people that you know and love. And we want to dig into these questions and offer a Christian response. My desire is hopefully to to spur on additional thought. Additional exploration and investigation, and most of all, to foster good conversation, to equip us to be talking about these challenging questions together, to equip you to have these conversations with others in your lives. And so we want to jump into these each week. We want to be a community where it's safe to ask these questions. And so we're offering a response each week, and maybe you want to share that, or maybe you want to go back and get caught up on one of the questions that you weren't able to be a part of. So you can, you can get there through our podcast or through our YouTube channel, PCTRNJ. It might be the way that you invite some others in your life, offer to share something with them, and then invite a conversation later. As we move into this morning's message, I was thinking about a conversation I had this week with a good friend of mine, and as we were talking somehow, I don't even know how, the conversation turned toward Richard Simmons. And if you're under the age of 40, you're going, I have no idea what you're talking about. (laughs) And so let me give you a picture. This is Richard Simmons. This is, in fact, the picture that if you go to his website, richardsimmons.com, this is the picture that greets you. And so I'm just giving you what he is giving the world. And in the 80s, Richard Simmons inspired so many people to start moving their bodies, right, to get involved in fitness and exercise. He was so positive and so inspiring that so many people who didn't consider themselves athletic in any way started to move onto a journey towards self-care, toward health, toward fitness. And, and so, I mean, he's certainly iconic. And as we're talking about him, I went to his website and, and it became an incredible waste of time because that's what the internet's good for. And I ended up on his shop and started to look at what's for sale. And I found, actually, there are Richard Simmons Funko Pop dolls. Now, if you're over 40, you may not know what that means. But here is Richard Simmons. You can see the incredible likeness. These are a couple of the options for his Funko Pop dolls. If you go to the next one, though, I saw this one. And what you can't probably read is that his tank top says, sweating to the oldies. This Funko Pop doll, though, is only available at Target. It's exclusive to Target, but fortunately for you, it is at the Target in Tom's River, so you can head there after the service. So rest assured, it's fine. It's funny, I, I, I happened to notice that this was exclusive to Target, and it's actually the second thing this week that I had this, I noticed was exclusive to Target. I was over there the other evening getting some ice cream, and I noticed that there's all these, these flavors of Ben and Jerry's that for some reason are exclusive to Target. And I was like, man, Target has got the inside track on some really amazing things. And, and I was thinking about this, this idea of exclusivity, and we like it. We even, we even love it when we're in the know, when we're on the inside. But we, we start to get a little uncomfortable with it. We don't like it so much when we're on the outside. And exclusivity especially becomes a problem for so many when it becomes about matters of spirituality, faith, and religion. Often we prefer not making exclusive claims about life and faith. We prefer not to draw firm lines or have to take firm stands. We know that it often leads to conflict and, and For many, this idea of the exclusive claims of religion have led particularly so many people to ask the question about the Christian faith, how can Christians claim there is only one true religion? How can Christians claim that there is, that theirs is the one true religion and that everyone else's religion is false? And even more, because of that claim, aren't Christians just hostile toward people of other faiths than those who don't agree with them? And these are very real questions. We want to try to move into these this morning. We're going to jump into the Gospel of John as we look at this issue of exclusivity. And if you want to follow along on the screen as we read this morning, 
I invite you to, we're going to jump in starting in John 13, verse 33. And these are the words of Jesus. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow me. You cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay my life down for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's pray as we move into this together. Heavenly Father, in these moments as we seek to hear from you, will you send your spirit to guide our thoughts, guide the meditations of our hearts, and Lord, if there's anything that I say that's not of you, may you cause it to be forgotten, to fall away, so that all that's left is what you intend to say. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So this is part of the Gospel of John known as the Farewell Discourse. The theme of this entire teaching or this entire section is that Jesus is preparing his disciples because he is going to be leaving them, that he's going to die, that they're going to be separated from one another. And as he said over and over, you can't follow me where I am going. And one of the great things that I I love about this passage is It's actually built on a series of questions that the disciples ask. We see three different questions in this passage. And if you kept reading in chapter 14, you see a number of other questions. And what I really love about it is that it's clear from the questions that the disciples just don't get it. That Jesus has been trying to tell them that he's leaving over and over again, but they keep asking, what? We don't understand. And yet they still feel free to keep asking, and Jesus patiently, gently, graciously, but directly answers their questions, and in in this way, I think, models some of what I hope this series is doing for us. But Thomas asks him the question in here, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And in response, Jesus offers, I think, one of the clearest, boldest statements of his entire ministry. He says, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. I mean, this this is just like we talked about last week when we're talking about the truth. We know that there's a huge difference between A and the. That definite article means something. You know, I live about five minutes from here, and I think if there's probably at least ten different ways that you could go to get to my house. And I can take any one of those ways, but some are more efficient than others. And as an engineer, I get a little twitchy when I start taking the long way. And so I I really try to take always the most efficient way. And for me, that becomes the, the way of choice. But it's still only a way. It's not the way. It's, it's, if there was only one way to get to my house, that would be the way, not one among many. And Jesus is saying so clearly in this passage that he is the way, not a way. And and here's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, do what I say, follow my teaching, and that will be the way that you get to heaven. He doesn't say, if you are good enough, if you take my principles seriously and you put them into practice, then that will get you to heaven. No, he says, I am the way. I am the path. I am the road. I am the door through which you must pass. It's not about your performance. It's not about your religious achievement. It's not about your moral goodness. It's all about me. I am the way. There is no other way. You can't get to the Father except by me. You will just get lost. No one gets to heaven on their own. Jesus is saying, I am the way. 
He says, I am the truth. In other words, it's not that Jesus just tells the truth. He is actually the truth, the absolute truth embodied. He is absolute reality in the flesh. This is an exclusive claim that he is the truth. There is no other truth that is contrary to him, that is outside of him. We actually see the truth revealed in him. He goes on and he says, I am the life, the life. And that's such a full word. I mean, yes, he's the source of the life that we live, but he is also the source. He is eternal life. He is the life also that is full and rich and beautiful here and now. He is the life that we long for. And he's making these exclusive claims. He is the way, the truth, the life, and then he caps it all off and just makes sure it's abundantly clear. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no wiggle room here. These are exclusive claims. There is no wiggle room to get out of this honest question. How can Christians claim that there is one true religion? It's because of this. It's because Jesus says so. There's no wiggle room. We can't just reject the question by saying, no, 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 the the question, they don't understand. They're misinformed. That's not what Christianity is about. No, it is. These are exclusive claims that Jesus is making. And so we have to figure out how do we grapple with these claims. And and exclusive claims are hard, especially when it comes to matters of faith and religion. They've caused so many to reject it. And really, it's not just because the truth that is claimed is hard to deal with and that it demands an exclusive way of living. It's because those who hold on to exclusive claims are often people that become arrogant towards others that are often filled with self-righteousness and hatred and that so quickly has led to violence and conflict and war. Just look at, look at history. It's so clear, right? Or at least it's clear to many. William Kavanaugh wrote an article in 2007 entitled, Does Religion Cause Violence? And he actually argues against that, that it's not just religion that caused violence, it's so-called secular ways of living have also brought on incredible amounts of violence in in the world. But he cites a book in this article by a man named Charles Kimball, and the book is entitled, When Religion Becomes Evil. Now, this is one of many books that came out in the post-9-11 years, grappling with the, the atrocity that we all remembered just a couple weeks ago. And in that book, Kimball makes the claim, he says, it is somewhat trite, but nevertheless sadly true to say that more wars have been waged, more people killed, and these days more evil perpetrated in the name of religion than by any other institutional force in human history. And this is a very pervasive view of religion that makes exclusive claims. And if we're honest about the history of the Christian movement, If we look at how Christians have lived the Christian faith over all the years, we have to get real that in the midst of of a lot of good and a lot of beautiful things, there is also a history filled with arrogance and self-righteousness and hatred and violence and war. To pretend that that's not true is not being honest. And so this critique, this question, this rejection of the exclusive claims of Christianity is not just some half-baked idea. It comes grounded in some evidence when they look at the history of how the Christians have lived out the faith. And so there's been at least a couple of primary responses to this challenge, that if religion is at the forefront of propagating violence and hatred and war, then what needs to happen? Clearly it needs to be suppressed. And so there's been two kind of major ways, at least, that we'll talk about this morning that I think that's happening in our culture. The first is is very simple. Keep it to yourself. Right? That that we don't talk, forever we haven't talked about politics and religion, but now we really don't talk about either, at least with anybody that disagrees with us. You know, and anything you would share in the public square that would come from your religious belief, your exclusive religious convictions, just keep it to yourself. And we've kind of had this misunderstood and misapplied understanding of church and state as if somehow any idea that comes out of a religious conviction has no application in the public square. No, no, no. Keep it to yourself. It's fine. You can believe and practice whatever you want in the quiet of your own home and in your own religious circles with those gathering that are like you, but but don't let it spill out into public life. 
It's a lot like we talked about last week, the idea of you do you. Right? It's fine. You can, you can have your beliefs. Just don't bring them out and try to, to have anybody else buy into them. And man, there's a lot of pressure to keep this to ourselves. And it's working. In 2019, the Barna Research Group, which does a lot of research about Christianity and culture and the relationship between the two, found that many in the church are actually feeling this pressure and giving into it. When they were asked in, the, in a survey, th- these are evangelically minded, so they, they care about Jesus a, a lot, right? Evangelically minded people in the church that when asked if they agreed, if it is wrong to share one's belie- personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith, 19% of baby boomers agreed. It's wrong. 27% of Gen Xers believe that it's wrong, and 47% of millennials believe that it is morally wrong to share your faith with someone else in the hopes that someday they too will come to share the faith that you believe. It is morally wrong. That's the pressure. Keep it to yourself. And the pressure's working. But here, what, here's the problem. Among many, what if, there's, what if there is good in the exclusive claims of that religion? That even though others can't see it, it's for their benefit. All right, a number of years ago, I was at a training with an organization called Food for the Hungry, and they do developmental work in the poorest countries, in the poorest places of the poorest countries in the world, and you know, they're working on, on teaching sustainable practices in agriculture and health and sanitation, and, and they, it all comes from, for them, a Christian worldview, but they're not, they're, they're not just excluding those who, who don't hold to a Christian worldview. They're trying to teach this, this way to help develop. And they were telling a story in this training about a group that had gone to tribal Africa, and there was this group of nurses that were teaching all about science and germs and about sanitization and and trying to help address the incredibly high infant and child mortality rates. And they're teaching and they're teaching, and they can't seem to get any traction. And then one day, one one of the locals who had formed a relationship with the nurse said to her, hey, do you want to, do you want to know how it really works? And she, what? how people get sick. And of course, the nurse is kind of put back by this, but, but is curious and says, sure. And she was informed that at night, one of our enemies comes to our window and puts a curse over the people in the house, and that's why they get sick. And so to help them get well, you've got to break the curse. That's how it really works. And, and of course, the nurse w- was wasn't sure exactly what to do with this, was confused, but, but was grateful that, that, that her friend had trusted her with this information. But here's the question. Should the nurse stop teaching germ theory because it's an exclusive claim and it opposes the exclusive claim of the tribe? Should they stop teaching about sanitization even though they've got plenty of evidence that when it's applied in the tribes around them, when actually people embrace, when they shift from this exclusive worldview to this exclusive worldview, then it actually leads to life and health and vitality. And maybe we start to go, well, okay, I guess. I guess when it's matters of life and death, then, then I guess it's okay to share your exclusive belief in hopes that somebody else will buy in. And I think that's the same thing is happening here, though. We just don't maybe like it as much. Because I think Jesus is saying, hey, this this is life and death. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. If that is, in fact, true, the stakes are too high to keep it to ourselves. But that's the pressure. I think the the other thing, that the other way that our culture is trying to to you know, suppress the, the influence of religion and the exclusive claims is to downplay the distinctions between the religions, to kind of flatten them all out. In, in other words, to, to say that all religions and worldviews are basically the same. And it's often depicted with maybe an illustration that you've heard of an elephant, where the, the, the story is meant to argue that all paths are equally valid because we all only have a limited view, limited perspective of what is true. I heard this illustration actually for the first time. I, I heard it from Pastor Tim Keller. And the way the story goes is that there are these blind men, and they, they all bump into an elephant, and they're blind because they, really, they only have 
a, a limited view of the world, and the elephant is supposed to be absolute reality. And one blind man runs into the elephant's trunk and, and feels it and st- starts to describe, man, an elephant is something long and floppy. And another one ha- has run into the legs and is like, no, no, you're totally wrong. An elephant is strong and sturdy. Another has run into to the side and the flank and says, no, 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 an elephant is big and smooth. Man, it's incredible. And another says, yeah, you're right, it's smooth, but you're wrong. It, it, it's, it, it's not firm, it's floppy. They ran into the ears. Right? Each of these blind men ran into a different part of the elephant and is describing it. And so on one hand, they're all true. On the other hand, they're all argued that they're all false because they only have a limited perspective. And this story is supposed to make us think that all religions, all paths are basically the same. They have equal parts of truth and they have equal parts of falsehood because they only see through a limited view, a limited lens. And Leslie Newbegin was a, a missionary in India for lots of years, and as he was trying to proclaim among, among the, the people there that Jesus was the way, the truth, the life, he got lots of resistance and heard this story, this illustration, put over and over and over again as resistance. And he became frustrated. Until one day he had an aha moment where he realized that this story, this story is told from the perspective of those who get to stand outside the story. It's not told from those who are on the inside. But those who are on the outside have the luxury of being able to see the whole picture. They know the whole picture of the elephant, and they can make the commentary that, oh, these blind men only see partially. They have a limited perspective. And he realized that when, we, when the claim is made that all paths are equal, it's being made as if those who make that claim are able to step outside of it, and they get to claim to see the whole picture clearly. They don't consider themselves part of the story as those who might have their own limited perspective. They claim to have the whole perspective, and so they push back on others who claim they might have the whole perspective. And in the process, Leslie Newbigin realized that, that those who are, are making this claim that all paths are equally valid are making just as exclusive a claim as those who rest on the exclusive claim that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This, this way of thinking ha- has certainly taken modern popularity in the term coexist, right? That that's, that's kind of this idea that all these paths, all these faiths are equally good, equally valid. You know, and, and that is, it, it really is just as exclusive a statement to say that they're all as valid as it is to claim that only one is valid. And you, you can you can prove this out a little bit if you push on that idea of, of coexistence. And, and those who are trying to hold to that fast, when you push against it with another exclusive claim, what kind of response does it often get? It often gets a response of frustration, of anger, sometimes of violence. And so what you find is that is just as religious a claim as those who are making exclusive religious claims of their own. And so it's not about ex- eliminating exclusive claims. I don't think we can. I think we all live based on some exclusive claims. And so the real question is which exclusive claims will you live by and what kind of life do those exclusive claims lead to? You know, this idea of coexistence and tolerance, I mean, it sounds, you know, it sounds very appealing on the surface, you know, but I don't think that that's what's meant when we say tolerance, because I don't really want to just be tolerated. Understand that it actually means to affirm what my, my belief is, my exclusive claim. I want you to affirm that my exclusive claim is valid and exclusive, and you have to agree with it. And it pushes against any other exclusive claims. And, and I don't want to just be tolerated. I don't think any of us really want to just be tolerated. I want something more. I want life that is, is full. I want depth of relationships, even with those that I disagree with, who I don't see eye to eye with. And so what kind of life does the exclusive claims that you're living by lead to? I included the, the portion of chapter 13 in this passage because Jesus, at the very beginning of what we read, says this. He says, a new command I'm giving you to love one another. To love one another. Now, that in and of itself isn't new. As a matter of fact, it feels like that just reinforces this idea that all paths are good because all we need is love, right? 
But Jesus pushes even further. He says, no, 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 I want you to love one another just as I have loved you. Well, what he did right before this was he just finished washing the disciples' feet. Their muddy, dirty, stinky feet. And I don't know if you've ever washed feet, but you know, just give it a try and you can put yourself in Jesus's, in his spot for a moment. But this is what he's saying. Love this way, with this kind of humility, this kind of servanthood, this kind of willingness to put others above yourselves. Love like that. Love humbly, like a servant. Love sacrificially. Because Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Well, how is he going to get there? He's got to go through the cross. The only way for Jesus to make a way for them is to go and die the death that they should have died in their place to open up access to the Father, to the absolute truth, to life itself. And he's saying, love one another like that. That's the claim. The exclusive claim that I make on your life, on this exclusive truth, is to love one another like that. And some might hear that and just go, yeah, well, that's why, it just reinforces why I hate exclusive claims. Because look, Jesus is saying to love one another. And that's what all exclusive claims do. They create an inside group and an outside group. And it's always about taking care of those who are on the inside, those who are right, taking care of your tribe. And it always becomes this place of self-righteousness, this place of looking down their nose on everybody else, a place of hatred and judgmentalism. And it becomes so hypocritical. And it's so easy to justify on a slippery slope to violence for everybody who disagrees. Well, if you only had John 13, I still think it would be hard to argue, but if we put right next to that Matthew 5, which we read a little bit earlier, and you get the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says so clearly, he says, you've heard it said, right? You've heard it said to love one another and hate your enemy. Love your your brother, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I'm telling you, to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus is saying, hey, if your form of Christianity, based on my exclusive claims, creates an inside tribe where anybody else is, is the object of your hatred, of your condemnation, of your judgment, then you are not actually living by the exclusive claim that I'm putting on your life because I'm calling you to love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Yes, even those who have opposing exclusive claims and are even hurtful to you. But Christians have often gotten this wrong, haven't we? I mean, I think par- partially we've gotten it wrong because it's hard. Because it requires us to die the death to self and to self-interest. That's, it requires us to follow Jesus in the death that he died on our behalf. But in Romans 5, chapter, in Romans 5 verse 8, it says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. When we were enemies of God when we were in rebellion against him, when we were hard-hearted toward him, that he sent his son to die for us. And if God would die for me when I am an enemy of his, then how could any enemy of mine, how could I treat them with hostility and contempt? If Jesus would die in my place to bring me forgiveness of sin and access to the Father, how could I not offer grace and forgiveness to anyone who has harmed me? I mean, because what I would offer to you is nothing compared to what God has offered to me. The exclusive claim of Christ says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to turn your back on me in rebellion, and yet I am going to restore you to the place where I am going because I am going to die in your place. The exclusive claim of Christ that he is the way, the truth, the life is one that is powerfully humbling for those who hold on to it because it acknowledges that we have no way to the Father on our own. I had to have somebody die for me. And it is also incredibly uplifting and overflowing because it's because God loves me so much that he would do this. And so I can then turn around and offer that love to one another and even to my enemies. And so what kind of exclusive claims are you basing your life on? And what kind of life is that leading to? And if you are claiming to be a follower of Christ, does it look like this? to love one another, humbly, sacrificially, to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is an amazing reality that while we have been enemies of you, that you and your love 
sent your son to die in our place, to make a way to you, to allow us to have access and hope. Lord God, we acknowledge that we have been at times filled with, with judgment, filled with condemnation. Lord, may we be may followers of Jesus, may we be filled with humility and servanthood and love so that we can love the way you have loved us. Lord, may you allow us to be a people who can even love across the exclusive claims of religion and worldview. Lord, may you continue to foster conversations that we can be a light to those who need to know. It's in Jesus' name, amen.